Hello and welcome to Socially Holistic Podcast. Socially Holistic helps coaches and holistic entrepreneurs and women in heart-centered businesses make sense of social media so they can build their own online network and get more clients. As a heart-centered business owner, you do amazing work. Holly's mission in life is to help you help more people. Help us help more women in business with a five-star review of this podcast. Please leave one today over at iTunes. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more heart-centered businesses will be successful. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Socially Holistic Podcast, episode 43. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm here with today's special guest, Louise Carden. Louise is the queen of calm. Welcome. Hi, Holly. Lovely to be here with you. I'm so excited to have you today. (laughs) Um, Why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about your background, because you have a very fascinating background prior to your current business. Um, well, yes, I, I guess so. I, I started out as a geologist when I was a teenager. I was very interested in science. And uh, if you looked at the blog I put out last week, you'd see that originally I really wanted to be an astronaut. Mm-hmm. And then I discovered that astronauts had to have perfect eyesight, which I didn't. Mm-hmm. So uh, I had to change my my ideas about where I was going. But I became really interested in in the earth and the, the landscape and the way things were on our planet. And I became really passionate about geology and I took a degree in geology and went into the oil industry. Mm. So I, I worked as a geophysicist uh, looking for likely places where we could drill for oil and gas, mm-hmm. mainly in the North Sea. But I got to travel all over the world, which was was great because in your 20s that's something exciting you can do but I did notice how stressed everybody was and I used to find that when I went home to my mum's for Christmas I often spent the whole holiday in bed because I kind of collapsed and although everyone seems to keep going on adrenaline when they have to when you take that vacation you take a break over the weekend you find you've got no energy left to do anything else and I do remember one occasion when I had a big presentation to do and I just lost my voice completely so I did all this work preparing for this meeting and then I couldn't actually speak and it became very clear to me that even doing something you love it can still be really stressful And so after 15 years in the oil industry, I decided perhaps it wasn't really for me, although I had great salary, I traveled all over the world, I didn't really see the point to it. You know, it just seemed that there was something missing. So I decided that I wanted to have a business of my own and I looked into all sorts of different things. And I had my my father ran his own business for years and his accountant said to me well what's wrong with your family business so in the end I quit my job and I went to work with my dad and my cousin in the business that dad had had for I suppose probably 40 years uh, which was in the fencing business so I started working in construction Mm. which is a really kind of weird (laughs) step to take but again you know I'd spent a lot of time working with men in the oil industry so I was used to working in a sort of really masculine environment. So going into construction wasn't really that different. But I also found that everyone was really stressed out there, you know, a lot of time spending rushing around and deadlines and not getting paid. My dad was was really stressed. He had high blood pressure, he had heart problems. Um, And in the end, the doctor said, you know, you've got to give this up because it's really not good for your health. But after five years of doing that, I I got married and I had kids and I discovered actually I couldn't do that stressful job at the same time as bringing up the children because I was an older mother, I guess. You know, you you have limited reserves of energy and I found that I couldn't give my attention to to both in the way I wanted. So I I was a stay-at-home mom for a long time, Mm -hmm. but because I found... Being at home with the kids, I still found that I needed other things to do. So I did a lot of volunteer work, particularly with the National Childbirth Trust. And again, I found there that new mums suffered from a lot of stress. So I just got everywhere. I was finding people who were finding life stressful. And so I became interested in complementary therapies primarily to, to help my kids, to help them go to sleep, to help when they were worried 
And through that, I came across the system of Reiki. Mm -hmm. And I found that really useful for helping the children to calm down. But it also, well, it is primarily a system for personal development. So you need to learn how to calm yourself down Mm -hmm. so that you can then help other people. Mm -hmm. And I guess it all took off from there once the children got a bit older and they were in school I had more time to to do things myself and I started seeing clients and running workshops and I now teach Reiki I teach meditation and mindfulness practice so lots of different ways that you can learn how to calm yourself down Um, and really you know the the calmer you can be the easier it is to take control of your life and get back on top of things so when you're when you're feeling stressed, it's very much a downward spiral that you feel you can't get back out of. I think that's so accurate. And I think that also when we're so stressed, it's so difficult to have that vision that we need to run our businesses. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And Absolutely. it's so difficult to see exactly where we need to be headed, what our objectives should be, whether we're actually achieving them, because it's just you're in that constant state of stress that's just not very effective at all. Yeah, and I think the sad thing is that people in, certainly in the Western world, don't put their own health and well-being first. Mm -hmm. They're always trying to wait until they've got enough money to pay for better health care or until they've got more time. And in fact, you'll never achieve any of those Mm -hmm. things if you don't get yourself back under control first because, you say, you just can't think straight when you're just bumping from one crisis to the other, mm. uh, you need to have some way of of making sure that your health and well-being comes first so that you can take care of the rest of your life. Yes, I agree. And I think you mentioned something on your website about how you've seen, you know, nutrition experts who are just not looking well and, and mm-hmm. fitness coaches who are overweight and mm-hmm. and uh, financial experts who are just struggling with their finances. And it's it's all down to that it's about taking care of yourself and your business first before Mm -hmm. you can help anyone else you can't help your clients if you're not in a state of balance no absolutely and so many people who are in the health and well-being industry in particular they go into that business because they primarily want to help people Mm -hmm. but it's it's like that old thing with the oxygen mask you know on the Mm -hmm. on the planes you know put your oxygen mask on first Don't help anybody else until you've got that way of breathing. Because if you pass out, you're not going to be able to help anybody. And it's the same with your families. You know, if you're you're looking after your family, you're responsible for your family. If you get sick, who's then going to look after them? But in the West, we kind of think that it's selfish to take care of ourselves. But in Mm -hmm. fact, if you think about the bigger picture, it's selfish not to take care of yourself first mm-hmm. because everything will go down like a pack of cards <laughs> if something happens to you. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you've overcome in your business? Have you really struggled to help people understand this concept? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people think that they know this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I will tell them all this and say, oh, yes, you know, yeah, I've realized that. I do know that I've got to eat better I know I've got to take some exercise but they won't do it you know Mm -hmm. it's kind of intellectually they know that they must do this but it's actually taking that action that Mm -hmm. seems to be the problem and I think the issue with this is that you need somebody there to give you support to encourage you it's like anything that you do new some well some people are much more self-motivated so for some people they can do this on their own but other people will need to be shown need to be helped and need Mm -hmm. to be supported to make sure that they are actually putting it in to progress and sometimes you know like the people you you talked about people who don't actually look like they take their own advice um you know nobody's going to want to buy with from them if they Mm -hmm. don't actually personify what they're doing so as you say I I use the tagline the queen of calm and I think most people when they meet me get that sense of calm coming from me yes but even so you know I still have to work quite hard to explain to people that they do need help and support in order to put some of these strategies into place for themselves Mm. because people will always put something else first well, I think we understand the concept on a rational level, but it's like sometimes it's like almost like we need permission either from mm-hmm. other people or from ourselves to actually put ourselves first. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that, is, that is true. And I think particularly true for women because women, 
you know, in past times were brought up to please other people you know mm. first please their parents do what their parents wanted them to do then maybe if they get married do what their husband wants to do or their in-laws you know it's always about making sure that everybody else is happy but not necessarily you mm. and I'm sure we all know stories about women who gave up working to look after their families and have really felt their life was unfulfilled you know because they were always taking care of somebody else first mm. Yes. And how do you help people shift their mindset and, and really understand that, that it is okay and that it is necessary for them to put themselves first? Well, I mean, one of the ways that, that we can do that is actually giving ourselves time to sit quietly, giving ourselves some, just a place where nothing is interrupting us, nothing mm -hmm. is going to distract us from actually thinking about ourselves. But a lot of people find that really difficult so you know in my meditation classes people come to a meditation class or a group and they're going to be there for an hour and an hour where all the attention is going to be on themselves and people are often absolutely amazed that the time has gone so quickly because they think I can't spend an hour on myself and after I've done maybe a meditation that lasts half an hour I'll bring them back to the room and I say well that was half an hour. And they go, really? That was half an hour? And they just can't believe how time adjusts, you know, how much you, you – when you're in a meditation or even doing something like Reiki, you know, time actually has no meaning mm -hmm. because time doesn't really exist. We have clocks which measure this thing we've created called time. And time is something that we all feel we don't have enough of. But, in fact, we create our own time. And if you can just sit – even for five minutes quietly and just pay attention to your own breathing, you will find that you feel so much calmer, so much more relaxed, and you can actually get clarity on where you want to go and what you want to do. But most of the time, our heads are so messed up and got all these ideas going on, all the things we've got to do next, what we've got to do for other people, that we, we need to be able to clear those and just reflect on what's important but most of the time we don't do that. <laughs> now, you've been in business since 2004, is that mm -hmm. right? And so that's 10 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. How has your business changed over time? Well, when my children were younger, it very much had to, to fit around them. So my youngest is now 16. So 10 years ago, you know, he was just going into school. So I had time during the day. But it meant that once they were back from school, I couldn't really concentrate on on much else so I suppose I, my business just ticked along really for the first few years while they were still needing my attention quite a lot but then I had to follow my own advice you know and so you have to do something for yourself and so I did a lot of training in those years so that mm -hmm. um, I was spending the time sort of building up my experience I was seeing clients but I didn't actually start teaching until 2008 mm -hmm. So I've, I've had that, that experience that I think you need to have before you can start running workshops or teaching classes. You've, you've got to have something really to back up what you do. And I think you also need to have those examples and that evidence that you can bring through from people that you've helped mm -hmm. in the past. Um, so now I do much more teaching, whereas at the beginning I was seeing more one-to-one -one clients. Oh, okay. And so mostly you're working with people using Reiki, flower essences, and you've also got a monthly meditation group, yeah, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Reiki is a mindfulness practice, but I think for some people it's a bit too woo-woo. Not the way I run it. I, I very much, I'm very down-to-earth person, and I, I teach Reiki in a much more grounded way than, than people expect. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people come in with the meditation or the mindfulness practice. Mindfulness is very much an in topic at the moment. You see lots about mindfulness in the press and on the internet. And certainly even the National Health Service promotes mindfulness practice now alongside talking therapies for people with anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So it's very much something that people have heard about. So I get a lot of calls about those groups. Mm -hmm. And so if you like, it's a, a way into what I do, okay. um, which, which some people find um, easier to, to take up first. Because certainly flower essences, when you think about it, are a bit woo-woo as well. Because, 
you know, I make you up a little bottle and I put in a few drops of something that uh, has sat out in the sun with a flower sitting <laughs> in it. And, and amazingly, you can feel so much better after you take mm. that bottle. So again, sometimes the flower essences are a step too far, but something like the rescue remedy, the batch rescue remedy, which has been used since the 1930s, certainly in the UK, people are very familiar with it, but they don't necessarily know that it's a flower essence. And they don't necessarily know how it's made or what it is. They just know that if they're upset, they take the rescue remedy. And it works. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It certainly does. So how would you define mindfulness? Because I know even this is a very abstract concept for people, Mm -hmm. even though it is becoming more... well, known. well, mindfulness is about being fully aware of what you're doing in the present moment. So this means that when you're doing a task, you're not thinking about what happened yesterday or what you're going to do tomorrow or what you're going to cook for dinner. You're actually focusing on on the task in hand. So this means that everything you do in your life, you could do in a mindful way. But most of us don't do that because, as I said earlier, we've got so much going on in our head. We do most of the things we do in a mindless way. Mm -hmm. So take eating, for for instance. There's a lot of evidence that if we all ate in a more mindful way, which our ancestors did, we wouldn't put on so much weight because we'd notice when we felt full, mm-hmm. we'd also notice what we were actually eating. And sometimes people eat things they don't really like because they're not actually paying attention to what they're doing. They may be watching the TV, reading a book, driving their car, all sorts of things that they're doing at the same time as they're eating. Mm-hmm. Whereas centuries ago, eating was almost a ritual. You know, everybody came together. You probably prepared the meal. You knew exactly what was in it. It was important, almost a sacred ritual to have a meal. But now we just eat on the go, whatever we're doing, we don't pay any attention to it. And so we eat too much Mm. and we eat too much of the wrong things. And mindfulness, sorry. Yeah, that's just one example of of even doing the washing up. You know, you can do the washing up in a distracted way or Mm. you do it in a mindful way. And this is very much about single tasking rather than Mm -hmm. multitasking. And I think so many of us feel very proud of ourselves when we can multitask and do so many things at once because it's like it's become a sign of, you know, we are a working warrior. We can do so many things at once. But really, that's just not very effective. And it's just kind of a good way to start yourself down the path to stress. It certainly is. And I call this the myth of multitasking. And as you say, so many women are really proud of the fact that they can multitask. But the truth is... They do lots of things probably inadequately rather than one thing the best they can do. Mm. And as you say, it it leads you to being stressed. Whereas if you focused on one thing at a time, you would probably get them all done. Again, time is just this concept that we have, this concept that we don't have enough of it. If you did everything in order, you did one thing at a time to the best of your ability, I can guarantee you would have better results. But we we have this thing, oh, I've got to do this at the same time as I'm doing that because there isn't enough time. And we just end up not doing any of them properly. And we do ourselves a disservice that way. Yeah. Especially in our business Mm -hmm. um, because we're just not getting the results that we could be. No, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, even I'm guilty of that because I have lots and lots of ideas running on all the time. And we think, yeah, that's great. I need to do that. I need to do that. But in fact, you can't do them all to the best of your ability. So you need to pick one or maybe two and just focus on that and do it properly. And it will, your clients and people who want to work with you or buy from you, they will see that. Mm-hmm. And they will respond to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing is, is leading by example. Because mm-hmm. once, once your peers, once the people in your life see how you've changed, that can inspire them to do the same. Absolutely. Mm. So yeah. what are your top tips for how to go from frazzled to serene? <laughs> what would you recommend? Well, I, I do have um, a top 10 tranquility tip list. But one of my, well, my number one top tip is actually breathing. And everyone said, but we all breathe, Louise, you know, we're breathing all the time. And that is true. But most of us don't breathe effectively. If you look at a small child or a baby and watch them breathe when they're very still, you'll notice that their tummy moves up and down. And this is how we're all supposed to breathe. But as we become more stressed, we 
rush about, we slouch, our posture's poor, it becomes more difficult to breathe like that. And we tend to breathe using the muscles in our chest, shoulders and neck, and we breathe in a very shallow way. Now, this, of course, means that we don't get as much oxygen into our lungs as we should do, and therefore the oxygen doesn't get into our bloodstream and doesn't get through to our cells. And it also means that we don't clear that stale old air with the carbon dioxide we need to get out. So, number one, we're not giving our body the life-giving oxygen it needs, but we also put ourselves into a spiral of um, more stress because the more shallowly we breathe, the more tension happens in our neck, shoulders and chest. And that again makes us breathe in a more shallow way. So if you're feeling stressed, tired, lacking concentration, lacking in focus, any of those things, one of the best things you can do is just pay attention to your breathing for a few minutes. And this in itself is a mindfulness practice. Many mindfulness practices are just about observing the breath. And so you can do it standing up, sitting down, lying down, but you just need to have your back nice and straight. So there's plenty of room for your lungs to fully expand, your rib cage to expand and your tummy to gently move up and down. And then you just need to breathe in slowly and deeply, fully expanding your lungs, and then just breathe out again. Now, if you're used to breathing in a very shallow way, you might actually find this quite difficult. So maybe just do it a couple of times. But if you repeat that exercise a few times during the day, even just three breaths is enough to really calm you down and give you that opportunity to pause so that you can see things more clearly. Mm, I love that. Mm -hmm. That's so easy. And I think it's yeah. something that everyone can do if we can just mm -hmm. remind ourselves either by setting an alarm on our calendar or, yeah. or something. Absolutely. I mean, I teach a one minute meditation. And when I do that in my meditation class, people are amazed again when I tell them, well, that was just one minute, the same as they can't believe they've been meditating for half an hour. They can't believe that they were only meditating for one minute. And when people say, you know, I'm too busy to do that. I don't have any time. The answer to that, of course, is the busier you are, the more often you need to meditate. Mm. But it could just be for five minutes. You know, just you'd really be surprised what a difference it can make to the way you're feeling in that moment. And what do you say to people who say that they can't meditate, that they've tried, that they just don't know how to do it? It doesn't work for them. <laughs> no, I have a lot of people who come to my class and they say, I've bought CDs, I've gone to other classes, I can't do this. And this is what I mean about sometimes you know what you need to do, but you actually need the support of a teacher to help you. Mm. Um, I do have a five-minute meditation on YouTube. Okay. Uh, lots of people have looked at that and filmed, found it helpful. It just, I think it just says five-minute meditation on my uh, Louise Carden YouTube channel. And you just put that on your computer. You just listen to my voice, follow the instructions. And I've had a lot of feedback from, from that, from people who said that they couldn't believe that they felt better in, in five minutes. Ooh, excellent. And that's, that is a breathing one, so I ask you to pay attention to your breath. Okay. Um, and it's, yeah, but, it, but sometimes you need a bit of support from somebody else. And a lot of people don't realize quite how easy it is. You know, they try and make it more complicated. The Western mind is great for thinking that things must be more complicated than they are <laughs> because we, we don't believe that simple is good. We believe complicated is good. So often people are just overthinking, you know, they... They think that they can't do meditation because they're expecting it to be something much more complicated than it really is. Mm. Or they're expecting some fantastic results, like yeah. you know, floating through the clouds and sparks yeah. and glitter everywhere, when, when really it's simply about simplifying things and just, you know, relaxing. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Do you have any other tips to share? I, I know that we've kind of ventured off into a tangent. Yeah, no, that's fine. As I say, there, there are 10 on my list. Okay. One of the other ones that I think is really important, especially for women, is setting boundaries with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're always ready to say yes whenever somebody asks us to do something, help out at school, help the neighbours, running around here, there and everywhere. And again, it's really great that you help other people. And being of service is one of the reasons we're here on this planet. But you can't help everybody. 
And sometimes you really drain your own energy. You can really make yourself ill by trying to please everybody and trying to help everybody. You have to set aside some time for yourself and say, no, I can't do that today because this is a day when I do this or that. You know, you really – and people – if you don't set boundaries, people expect you to say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. But once you start getting in that habit of saying no sometimes, people respect that and they'll understand that you are, you know, you're willing to help, but you can't help with everything. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, back to that thing, you know, if you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of anybody. Yeah, I think that's so important. I think we can't remind ourselves of that enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's so easy to forget. It is. And, and it just plays in this guilt thing that we've all got going. You know, if we don't do that, we feel guilty. And guilty is just another aspect of of fear. And we really want to let go of a lot of the fear-based things that we have in our lives. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) So, Louise, do you have any women business mentors? Are there any women in business who inspire you? Yeah, I mean, I've done, over the years, I've done quite a lot of training And I I guess the thing that appeals to me is, you know, women who have done well for themselves without selling their soul, I guess, to commercial aims. So, you know, a lot of us get by in life by pretending to be men. Mm -hmm. uh, And that's something that I was guilty of in my corporate days. And, And even now, a lot of women have to get to the top by behaving like men. And I came to believe that actually women do do things in a different way because women have different needs in their lives. You know, they want different things out of life. So I think there is a lack of, of good role models for, for women in business, but certainly I've done quite a bit of work with Joanna Martin Mm -hmm. and I found her work really helpful, especially her ideas on the feminine way to wealth Mm -hmm. and also Catherine Watkin, Mm -hmm. who I've done sales training with and, I'm sure some of you know her, that her thing is about how to uh, sell without being pushy. And for a lot of women, we just hate that commercial icky side of (laughs) marketing and selling. And, you know, she's done really well by just being a lovely person. Mm -hmm, And I think I think we all want to be able to do that. Mm, Yes, I agree. But a lot of us feel that we can't be authentic, that we can't really be ourselves because in being ourselves, we won't make enough money or we won't get enough clients or, you know, it's, it's just not going to work if we are ourselves. And again, it's back to that fear-based thing that we all have going on. We feel that we're not good enough. We have to do something different than be ourselves in order to succeed. Mm, and I think it's exactly the opposite because mm-hmm. and this is one of the things that I teach in my social media and marketing mm-hmm. courses is the more authentic you are and the more you represent yourself naturally and authentically online, the more your ideal clients will recognize that and be drawn to you yeah and people will self-select they'll realize that you know they like you or they don't and and that's perfectly fine both ways yeah absolutely and I think you know when we start out in business and we're fearful that we won't be able to get any clients we want any client you know any client Mm. is better than no clients but as you go on in business you realize any client isn't better than no client because there are some clients you don't really want and if you're attracting the wrong kind of client your business is probably going to make you miserable. Mm -hmm. You need clients who really want to work with you, who get who you are, see who you are and want you to work with them because of that. Yeah. So Louise, how can other women in business benefit from working with you? What would you recommend? Well, I, I think it's, it goes back to this taking care of yourself first, you know, giving yourself some time so that you can help other people better, so that you can focus more on your business, so that you can get clarity in what you're doing, so that you can actually reconnect to the authentic you. Because somewhere deep down inside, the real us is still there, but we've covered it over with so much other stuff that we've done in our lives. And this goes back to the point, you know, where I see – nutritionists who don't look well they know that they want to help other people which is great but they haven't taken the time to look after themselves first and sometimes well you know my first step is actually identifying that you've got a problem Mm -hmm. you know you know there's something wrong but you're not quite sure what it is it may be that you're 
you've actually chosen the wrong way to help other people. Yes, you want to help other people, but maybe this business isn't quite the right one to fit for you. The one that is the good fit for you is the one that reflects your authentic self. Mm. And maybe it's a different, you can help people in a different way with, with a slight tweak. So it's about taking that time to reflect on what you're doing and taking that time to feel whether what you're doing is really the right thing for you. But until we, we give ourselves some space to do that, we really can't make that, make that decision. We can't see that there's something missing mm. because we're too busy rushing about. So it, it is about calming down first, finding some way of fitting into your daily routine and certainly the practice of Reiki is something that you practice on a daily practice, but it could be yoga, it could be Pilates, it should be some time that you give to yourself, even swimming, you know, mm-hmm. going up and down the swimming pool, where you're away from what you do, where you have to focus on what you're doing. So you have to do this in a mindful way. And then afterwards, you, you return to more clarity and focus. Mm, excellent. So you you have a free offer on your website, is that correct? For, for how to do yep. sleep better? Yeah, I've got my ten things that stop you getting a good night's sleep. Mm-hmm. Sleep is one of the things that, if you like, is a symptom that things aren't going that well for you. And there are so many, actually, quite simple things that you can put into practice, which will improve your sleep. Now, they're all very common sense things. They're all very easy. Uh, I had someone download it last week and I met her at a a networking event and I said, oh, I saw you downloaded uh, the report. Did did it help you? She said, yes, I've started doing some of those things. I just didn't occur to me that eating too late at night or, (laughs) you know, things that people do. Mm -hmm. But until someone points it out to them, actually, that might be where you're not sleeping so well. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they are quite obvious common sense things. Again, they're not complicated. They're simple. But it could make all the difference. And it may be just one of those on that list that you're doing. And if you stop doing it, you might sleep better. Excellent. And when we we don't sleep well, you know, that sets us up to fail the following day. Yes. I I am so dysfunctional when I don't get (laughs) enough sleep. (laughs) Yeah. And what would you recommend for people to follow on from that if they feel that they've, you know, gotten some benefit from that free report, but they feel like they need some more support from you? What would you recommend? I run a variety of of courses. I do see clients one-to-one, but I think people can benefit from the courses. I I can speak to people over Skype. Um, So if people wanted to email me, if they've got any uh, burning questions, I can often point them in the right direction. So I'm I'm more than willing to have a, a conversation with people. I do run courses. I also run online courses. So I do a meditation class online, for Ooh. instance, so you don't have to come to my office. I also run one which is particularly geared up for people who can't sleep well. So you listen to it before you go to bed and that sets you up ready to go to sleep. So I've got a variety of things on my website that, that may be of interest. Um, Excellent. It, I think it just depends on uh, the level of woo woo ness that people are prepared <laughs> to accept. This, you know, this seems mm-hmm. to be coming up in so many of my podcast episodes, and I'm very, very woo woo. <laughs> so I'm always shocked when people say that things that I find to be very normal are woo woo, <laughs> like flower essences. I think I've been using them since, my God, I don't know, yeah, almost 15 years. So to me, that's like obviously a normal thing, but of course, mm-hmm. you know, it's not. <laughs> no, and I think. People are open to these things once they've tried them. Yeah. But until you tried them, a lot of these things actually don't seem to make any sense at all. So it's about getting people to trust what I'm saying, that these things will help. <laughs> but they might find that trying the meditation or even just the breathing exercises, if they find that works for them, mm-hmm. then they might start thinking, well, perhaps there's something in this. Yeah. And I might take it a bit deeper. Mm, good. Well, Louise, where can people find you online? Uh, my website is louisecardon.com. Uh, and there's lots of information on there. I'm on Facebook. I work out of an office here in West Wickham called Keston Natural Health Practice. And there's a Facebook page for Keston Natural Health Practice. Uh, so some of my colleagues are on there as well. I'm on Twitter, which is Louise underscore Keston. And I'm on Pinterest, Google Plus, 
I'm all over the place. <laughs> okay. But you can find a lot of those links on my website. So if you go to louisecarden.com first, you'll find those links to other places. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think that was hugely informative, and I hope that's inspired our listeners to take some time out for themselves and help themselves first. Yeah, no, it's been great talking to you, Holly. Excellent. Um, glad that you're into the woo-woo, but... Uh... <laughs> Yes, very much so. <laughs> well, thank you again, and thank you for listening. And remember to visit sociallyholistic.com forward slash SHP43 for the show notes on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Socially Holistic Podcast with your host, Holly Wharton. Please help us help more women in business by giving us a five-star review of this podcast. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more successful businesses there will be. So please leave a five-star review today over at iTunes. Thank you.